Thank you very much, everyone, for joining this uh, CSA Development Economics webinar. Uh, my name is Margarita Klimek. I'm one of the uh, organizers of the seminar series, along with um, Emma Riley and Lucas Hansel. Um, before I introduce the speaker today, let me set the ground rules. Uh, Rushi is going to talk for 45 minutes. During this time, if you have any clarifying questions, can you please your, uh, use your Q&A box to type in your question? We'll read those out to the speaker um, at a convenient time. At the end, we're going to have 10 minutes for questions. And during this time, you can use your raise hand um, function. And when we choose you, we will unmute you uh, so you can ask your question directly. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Arusha Gia from the University of California, San Diego. She's going to be presenting the nexus of elites um, and, and war mobilization and empirical investigation. So thank you so much, Arusha. We are really excited for your presentation. Okay, so let me share my slides first. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity, uh, especially today. I'll try my best uh, to distract you from thinking about the election for 45 minutes. <laughs> let's, let's try. Uh, so this is a joint work uh, with uh, Ying Bai and the Zhao Zhao. So Ying is a faculty at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, Zhao Zhao is a graduate student there. We are still working on our draft, so it would be great uh, to get your comments. Uh, let me start with our uh, motivation first. So this is generally, this uh, paper is about elites and the war mobilization. Uh, as you may often observe that in conflicts, elites play a critical role in mobilizing citizens to participate, right? This naturally raises two important questions. The first is how do they achieve mobilization? I think now there's a burgeoning literature trying to open the black box of a mobilization. You know, the rule of media, the rule of social capital, the rule of leadership. And then there's another, uh, I think, equally important question is how does mobilization affect elite power after the conflict or after the war? I think this question you know, certainly speaks to who, but do they benefit, for example, speaks to who benefit from war. And this also has important implications if we want to understand how war affects the state after the conflict. I will uh, discuss this a little bit more after showing you uh, the result. So in this paper, we hope to speak to bo both questions. Uh, in one line, <laughs> our paper is about how elites mend war and the war also mend the elites. So we are adapting Tilly's line about war and the state. So in most specifically, I want to show you that elites use their personal network for war mobilization. And this war mobilization later elevated elite power, meaning that they would elevate in some regional elites involved in mobilization to the national political stage. So even though we have um, we are not aware of a, you know, similar studies before, but I think these uh, are general, pretty general to many conflicts and the war. Uh, so for example, on the first part, elites use their personal network for mobilization. Uh, there's some cases we read about, like in the Rwanda genocide, many of you may know better than I, but there's this fascinating book by political scientist Fuji. She interviewed uh, the participants in the genocide and the interviews reveal that it's actually often very personal ties that determines whether one joins the uh, gen kills his neighbor or not, rather than the ethnic labels. You see similar argument in other parts like the peasant rounds organization in Peru or the armed groups in uh, South Asia. In general, I think there's this intriguing observation that there are no similar like uh, systematic studies like in the existing literature, perhaps because it's often difficult to measure social network, especially in a conflict related setting, right? And the second part, how war mobilization later affect the elite power, you know, it also has a time-honored issue, I would say. Like here is a quote from a 
French economist uh, Gustave Molinari. At that time, he was observing the European powers had armed races. This is a decade before the World War I. And he forecasted that you know, this would continue because a group of the governing class, the elite class, would benefit from such a war uh, effort. So meanwhile, yet, you know, there seems to be you know, important question to study, given that it's not only helps uh, to understand who benefits from war, given that war is so costly, as we know, but also, as I was discussed, that matters if you want to understand how war affects the state later. Uh, and again, I think this lack of study is not because of a it's not important, but because it's often difficult to measure these issues, war mobilization, power, how could you observe these this, uh, variables? So in this paper, so I want to say that, uh, you know, we want to speak to these issues, we think they are important, but the challenges are also clear, uh, like how to measure each element in these three box is a, is a non-trivial. Then if you want to link this, ish, this uh, element, like if we say, oh, you need network effect war mobilization, how could we know it's not driven by other material variable, right? If we say, oh, actually, this war mobilization driven by the elite network affect the elite power later, how could we separate this is war mobilization from the rule of elite network? So we are uh, explored a context in this paper that we believe uh, it's very useful to uh, address both the measurement and identification challenges. As I explained, the, this context is not too special, it shares many similarity with other civil wars, but it's just the institutional setting allows us to measure these different elements and to establish their relationship. So this war we are studying is the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, I, this is a, the, one of the most deadliest civil war in human history. Uh, it started in 1850 and uh, lasted for 15 years. It has huge death toll. Interestingly, the last few years uh, of this civil war uh, coincided with the US civil war too. So at that time, it seems like globally, there's a, a lot of uh, wars going on. Uh, so we are not studied the peasant side so this war uh, has many interesting aspects. One of the most interesting why is that it, the, the large scale peasant re rebels were or suppressed or defeated by a relatively not so large army called the Hunan army. And the name of this army comes from the leader because this is an army organized by a scholar general from this Hunan province. His name is uh, Zeng Guofan. In this talk, I call him Zeng. Uh, so I explained to you uh, how this was organized. So it was, it came not from nowhere. There were already local militia in this province. They already fought with the Taipings. And after he got power, he turned to uh, his personal network to recruit a regular army. So that is the, uh, the army we are studying. And I explain more uh, to you the contest so on. Uh, so specifically, we'll study two things to speak to the two broad issues. The first is we'll study how the pre-war elite connection with this Deng, this uh, scholar general, affect where the soldiers who died actually came from. So is there, you know, if there's county with more people connected with him, would there be more soldiers die uh, from uh, arranging anything from that county? And then we'll, after establish this, we'll study the subsequent shift in the post-war distribution of political power towards the home county of the very elites in the, in the network. I'll also show you the network, of course. Uh, and the two key findings is just the first part is just we'll focus on this province, Hunan, uh, we'll establish the, um, the relationship between elite connection and the soldier deaths to speak to war mobilization. In the second part, to uh, uh, address the identification challenge, I'll explain more later, we have to bring out the counties. And once we do that, we are able to uh, make this link so we would be able to show that if there's a county has one more elite directly uh, linked with the general how many soldiers die and as a result of these soldiers how many national level offices 
were gained by people from that county. Richard, so sorry, really um, we have a question from Simon. Is it a good time to ask a question? Uh, Are you happy to take Yes, you can, please. Uh, thanks, Rishi. Um, I mean, you've motivated this paper in very general terms. And of course, most states now, including in low-income countries, have large professional standing armies. So should we think of this paper as relating to the role of an elite in commanding a standing army? Or should we think of this more as being about how a militia group might uh, build in a, in a yeah, much weaker good, capacity? Yeah, that's exactly related to the point on this slide. I think uh, this is more from the state side. This is very relevant if the state is weak. If the state, of course, it's a general lesson applies to armed groups now uh, you know, the using network to organize uh, armies, or not organize military groups, that's relevant. But for, from elite power aspect, it's more applies to uh, the cases where the state is weak. Where you can't even if you have you can co you could the state could coerce people people are not necessarily willing to fight or die for the country and that driven the result which I think still relevant you know is relevant in history but also even re also relevant today in many countries where you know the state is not strong even if they have an army which really there's war in fact there's a oh, it was also official army here but they just you know, they didn't want to die for the country or fight with the peasant who look like them, for example. But I'm happy to talk more about the external uh, validity also in the end. So uh, yeah, how we think about uh, this setting to the general literature uh, related to Simon's question. So the first, I think, is just uh, uh, add some new evidence to the uh, Understand, to the literature trying to understand the mobilization, as I want to emphasize, this is, seems pretty common, right? It applies to uh, non-state groups. It's a, also maybe applied to the state groups when the state was not, uh, is not so strong. Uh, and the second part is, uh, is kind of uh, speak to the mobilization and the post-war power structure. Uh, even though we, uh, there no, we are not aware of like studies on this topic. I think it's generally related to a broad literature. The think, think about you know how civil war affects states building pioneered by say basically and the peasants paper. Uh, and there are now a small empirical literature, growing empirical literature, trying to look at the consequences of civil war on state capacity. And this literature typically focus on text, uh, and they have like inconclusive or debatable findings. Some find that, oh, actually fighting civil war hurts tax uh, revenues, and some find actually benefits the state. So it's still in debate. We do not study taxation directly, uh, but we want to speak to this literature in the sense that it's maybe very useful to know how power structure, especially elite power changes due to the fight in the war. Uh, in our setting, in fact, I uh, discussed a little bit the rise of this regional elites weakened the state. Uh, if, but if you look at tax, you may also observe that tax increases, you know, to finance the war. So this is the message we want to deliver to this uh, literature. And of course, it's also related to a broader literature on conflict. And I want to offer two messages. The first is on recruitment. You know, most studies focus on non-state uh, groups, uh, but uh, you know, related to what I uh, discussed with Simon, here we study the state groups and I want to see, you know, when the state is weak, even the state side recruitment would reflect the social structure. The second is, of course, we know a lot about the cost of war, studied war, different perspectives, uh, but, you know, like in many wars, a small groups benefit at the cost of others. Finally, it's also related to a literature on a political economy or social network, like uh, work contributed by Julia and others, uh, as you will see uh, why it's related later. Uh, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about the context and the historical narratives, uh, because I, I try to be clear that it's a complicated setting uh, in a in a war, you may not know a lot about, so feel free to ask any question. Uh, then I'll tell you our data and environment. Then I'll zoom to the two topics. One is on the 
mobilization part, the other is on the power uh, post of the war part and, uh, and uh, uh, the presentation. So let me tell you first how this uh, rebellion started. So the Taiping Rebellion began in the southwestern province. I hope you can see that my mouse. So this is the, the uh, in the border uh, called Guangxi in 1815. And the underlying reason shares similarity with many like revolts in this era, like the state was weak, uh, there's population, there was population prior, there was corruption, there was even some ethnic computation in that province. The immediate reason was a famine driven by some weather shocks in the year before. And it was led by a guy called Hong Xiuquan. He's an enterprise interesting guy. He tried to become an elite through the traditional, through the system in, in the society, that is the, the civil service exam. Uh, and this is a political institution we needed to, we were used to study network. So he tried to rely on this. He tried it four times. Uh, and this exam doesn't happen, uh, didn't happen every year. So four times it's history, spent uh, its best 10 years uh, taking the exam, but he failed each time. So he got kind of a dissolution and a sick, et cetera. He converted it to Christianity and started a, 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 a worship society and attract many believers and the initial this is you know the society has a lot of grievance so well after they started the first revolt they launched a crusade uh, northward uh, toward the richer provinces they were pretty successful in the first few years so this is a map showing that you know their route in the first three years so by uh, 1853 they already you know, conquered quite a few major cities on the Yangtze River. You know, these are rich cities and conquered Nanjing, which is a coastal city. So the distance is over a thousand miles and they claim Nanjing as their national capital. And they, they claim whole, the sovereignty for the whole country. And Hunan is the shaded province. So it was on the front line because it's neighboring the origin of the uh, rebellion. So, uh, that you know when they when they declared the national capital in Nanjing and claimed the sovereignty for the country, the uh, central government realized that the official army was too weak. You know they were already realized because it's weak. It's often defeated by these peasants. So they have to organize a new army to fight uh, with the Taipings. So they appointed the Deng Guofan to organize army based on local militia. So. As I said, this is not by accident because in southern provinces, right, the state could not pro like provide the defense. So there are already local militia emerging from different provinces. And Hunan at the front line uh, is known for its militia. And Zeng at that time is an official, civil official. He had no military experience at all, uh, but he's an important official in the central government. So he was assigned to organize this army. And he used his, he relied on his network for recruitment, given the state couldn't really coerce people, uh, or even if they could coerce people, people wouldn't fight, right? Uh, so this is very well recognized by historian that he used uh, his network, especially through the people he got to uh, form relationship while the political institution, the civil service exam and uh, kinship uh, to mobilize people. Uh, and initially, the army was not uh, very successful because he, was, he had no military experience. So they had a lot of fightings and, uh, with the Taipings for the Navy. This fighting lasted uh, over a decade. And in 1864, uh, in the summer, the, uh, the uh, Hunan army conquered the Nanjing, the national capital of the Taipings, and ended the war. So they, fighted many, they fought many battles where we also know uh, the location and the year. Uh, hey, Rishi, uh, yeah. uh, Julianne has a question. Yes, please. I, I, it's just as a clarifying question. So the, the state was asked this guy to become a general and to kind of raise his army. Was it a similar effort to kind of raise resources and money from the same elites? And kind of could elites decide whether they wanted to contribute kind of men or money? Oh, uh, he was, yeah, this is good. So he was asked to organize the army, uh, but the army needed finance, right? 
So how could they finance it later? So in the first few years, in the very beginning, they just ask local elites to contribute. And soon, the, the government allowed the, the army to have a new tax, a new type of trade tax called the leaking. Uh, and that, that tax is the major way of, so it's like if you now the goods, uh, if they uh, transport, you know, come across, travel across uh, provinces or even prefectures, they have to uh, uh, to pay the taxes, so that the taxes are used to finance the army. So we don't study the tax, but that's one thing I mentioned before. If you study the tax, you tend to get a conclusion that with the war increase tax capacity or state capacity. But if you look at the power structure, it's actually weakened the state. And I'll, I'll talk more soon. Um, so yeah, so let's see. So this is the uh, one of the most important wars in Chinese history. So there are quite a lot of uh, interesting historical narratives by different groups of scholars. Uh, so. Uh, so we are not the first one to realize that the uh, network matter and this uh, war led to the rise of uh, the, the, the Hunan elites. So let me give you some just a summary of these narratives. The first is I want to clarify that most elites, uh, I'll show you the uh, network structure so on, in this network didn't really fight the battles. They just played an active role in recruiting people. So, so it seems that not that they, they, they led by say a rule of models, like they joined the army and the other people followed. That's not a very important. Then why did the network matter? From these narratives, you can think in economic languages, networks matters for information and the trust. So from the elite side, uh, they want to screen the people, the soldiers. They know that size of the army matters less than the quality because the official army had a pretty good size, but they were very, very weak. So they decided to screen the soldiers. And this is a, some, a, some citation, for, as you can see, just give you an idea that at the primer of this army, uh, it's, not, you know, it's not very large. It has soldiers who are, uh, 130,000. Uh, and this, you know, paid a lot of attention for use there, you know, people know each other, if people know, uh, uh, the elites know certain people, people know each other, use this kind of relationships to screen soldiers. And uh, Zhengguo Fan, the general uh, himself wrote about the preference of screening soldiers is that, you know, young, strong, simple-minded peasants are the best. So <laughs> they try to have this type of, uh, you know, soldiers. And for the soldier side, they also need a net, you know, I think network uh, facility to trust. Just for your information, the soldiers were promised a, a relatively good salary. It's actually twice the size of the official army and their family was promised some uh, money, some compensation if they died. And this number, uh, this tails is a, is a unit of silver. So the number is about twice of the yearly income of unskilled labor in that time, that region. But sometimes, uh, you know, they also tell the peasants who also told that, oh, this could be a good career for you. So all these kind of promises also need, you know, need some trust to be believable. And the network is useful in this sense. Uh, the second uh, uh, part, you know, that after the war or the war uh, led to the rise of the Hunan elites has been observed by historians too, even though they don't collect a systematic data to study this, but they really, you know, these are some quotes, say they're winning this war, launched the career of these Hunan leaders, and not only for the region, but these people, you know, are have offices at the national level, so they have affected the the you know the whole nation. And this is not only a, seems to be not only a short run then, uh, it's actually because once this this arise at the national political stage, they achieved the country's like fortune for a few generations, I would say, uh, and uh, because they made the major uh, policies, uh, and this is the good for this region, you know, the region now produced more political elites. However, the, it's not a good news for the country because this, you know, rise of the regional elites makes the central government is even weaker. So some historians argue that it's contributed to the eventual downfall of the state in 
1911, and that is like five decades after winning the war, and even overshadowed the later warlord era, where the warlords are following the examples of these uh, regional elites. Uh, so after, I'll uh, stop uh, he, I'll pause here for a second in case there are any clarifying question. Then I'll come to the data and the uh, measurement. Um, I think there are no uh, clarification questions good. at this point. So good. So now I want to tell you how we cope with a Maria elite network. And I would argue this is a very appealing setting to study elite network because the, the institution to form is, uh, networks among the elites is the civil service exam. So this is the, it's an exam system to recruit bureaucrats. That, that's the only channel for the society. So it's also the primary uh, social mobility channel. And not many people could succeed, but that's it, the, the channel to, to make a, a, to enable a commoner to become an elite, including all the bureaucrats for the state. So we'll use uh, three sources or links. The first major one is this uh, links from the exams, uh, from these exams. I'll show you how we define them. Uh, and also look at, we also know the blood relationship, like brothers and sons of them. In addition, we also know the marriages and his friends based on all these records of the army related to him. So, but as you can imagine, marriages and friendship may be endogenous. So in our baseline, we just focus on this first two because it's not subject to personal choice. And we use the other three for just completeness because in those biographies, it's also mentioned that you know his son, his in-laws also was very helpful in organizing the army. So well, now I want to talk about the exam network. So this is uh, this network built after each provincial and national level exam. So the exam has three level. Uh, there's entry level at prefecture. So just uh, to, get, to give you an idea that. The country has 18 provinces at that, that time. Under each province, there are about 10 to 20 prefecture. Under each prefecture, there are about 10 to 20 counties. So our analysis will be conducted at the lowest county level. But uh, so once you, you know, this provincial national, especially national level, already the, you know, the, the most important exam to produce the, the, the bureaucrats. So they are not, uh, they, they happen every, once every three years. And uh, uh, it's a very sophisticated system to avoid corruption. I can talk more later. So this system lasted 1,300 years. So you, you don't think too much about the corruption because it's like, you know, otherwise how could it maintain its legitimacy for, uh, the, for the selection as a selection system. Uh, but so there are two types of uh, links. Uh, in the exam that are important. One is the examiner-examinee relationship. The other is the quasi-classmate relationship. So examiner-examinee, the examiners were an important official, was an important official commissioned by the central government to supervise the exam. Uh, and the, the examinee are those who succeeded from the, uh, each say, national level exam. And the so-called quasi-classmate just mean those people who succeeded in the same exam. So what, how did this happen? <laughs> so it's like, so each, after each exam, uh, the new graduate paid uh, their respects for the, to the examiners and they all call themselves the disciple of the examiner <laughs> and they call their, the examiner their master uh, and they call each other uh, the you know, quasi-classmate uh, in Chinese it's basically meaning the same year. So the idea is that, you know, uh, Simon, say Simon is the examiner. He was already a very important official. Among these so many candidates, he selected me and the Chris and a few other you know, people as the future bureaucrats. He is his choice that made me a career. So I entered this master disciple pledge and with the norms that you know in the future we would help each other and weather the political storm. And of course there could be competition with other examiner examinee relationships. Uh, and just to clarify, just this is a very well explained by Miyazaki, like 
don't think this is education, even though they call it quasi classmate. It has nothing to do with education. These people didn't study together. Uh, and it's not all about teacher student relationship. It's very political. It's just a one time exam. But because I appreciated that, you know, this official picked me among the competitors, I entered into such a relationship. Uh, sorry, uh, Julian has um, a question. Yes, please. So I think you've just clarified this for me, but basically I shouldn't think of this as kind of either the kind of the Indian or the French system where you take this hellish exam and then you spend two or three years together studying before you become a bureaucrat is you spend a few years studying, then you take the exam and then you're a bureaucrat. There's no, yeah. there's no concept of the studying later. together. It's the later, yeah. Yeah, you studied with other people, you know, that doesn't matter. It's very ironic, like, you know, you studied with some teachers, you taught me a lot of things, but that doesn't matter. He, you know, he said that your obligation to the teacher fulfilled once you pay the tuition fee. It's a very political, because that relationship is not political, but it's right. Sunny who, you know, picked me and to become official and that to become the political link. And you can also think this is fairly intuitive because this is the third political institution, right? How people would form groups. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it seems natural that you know I appreciate your talent, and as you see that this is a, a each just to show you an example. So this is each circle indicate one exam. So these are different cohorts of exams. So it's each exam, national level exam, only two hundred or so people could succeed. So they all become important, like become officials later, right? And like then, then he when he succeeded in 1868, he succeeded in this, uh, this uh, cohort. Only three, including him, from Hunan succeeded in that year. So it's kind of, they also built some, and these are other people, those people uh, in, not in Black Dots are from other provinces. So naturally they kind of built some links with these people who succeeded together. And so he was examined by Mu Zhang He, you know, at that time Mu was already a very important official. So he actually is well known uh, in the 1840s, that's a decade before the war, Mu was very helpful in Deng's career. And so this, this is the whole this direct link was uh, linked, was formed. But Mu Zhang as a very important master, he also has other disciples while supervising other exams. And these people also form indirect links with them, right? So in our Maria, we can like uh, discount the uh, importance of links by steps, or we can use unweighted Maria. So that's how we built this network. And these people we highlight in red, you just if you know the Chinese history, you'll find it amazing <laughs> because these people later uh, all you know, become important figures in in different area like Li Hongzhang, he was very young in his 20s at this time. He later became the, after the war, after a few years, he became, in the end, he became the premier uh, of China. And say so Guo Song Tao, he, he actually later become, he was already a local elite at that, in, before the war, but later he became a national statesman. He was the first ambassador of China uh, to Europe. He, stayed, he was stationed in UK, in Britain, and France. So that's why we highlighted these people. Uh, and then this is our baseline. We only included the exam relationships and the blood relationships because they couldn't be selected by people themselves. They will also know who are some in-law relationship and some friends, but this is likely to be endogenous and maybe the friends part is also a bit selected. So we just include this as a robustness check. Uh, so is this clear? Uh, is there any question about this network? I hope I managed to explain this complicated thing. Yeah. Okay. So then we we are not so we, we are interested in like county level variation. So we are collapsed these uh, individuals into different counties. So in our baseline, we use the weighted measure where we weighted the individual's importance by their distance to them. All this refers to the connection with this general, scholar general. Uh, and we also use the unweighted measure. And this is just to show you, you know, through whole, 
both in the whole country and in the province, there's a lot of variation in the connections with him. So this is an unweighted measure. So some cross counties in his home province has over 10 people connected with him. Some has no, uh, you know, half of the counties have no people in that network. So use this variation uh, later. Uh, Rishi, I just want to yeah. mention that you have about 10 minutes left. Really? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, I want to, uh, uh, I want there are too many things to to talk about, so I don't need to cover everything. Uh, so let me uh, just to say that we also we are a bit worried about you know what this uh, county level connection capture are they related to development or political importance or the the war factor and the main message is that is not much related to geography or economic factors, but it, it is positively associated with the political importance, like how many uh, officials in, in the, before the war in that, uh, coming from that county. So later we are, you know, we are worried, you know, is our network measure capture the specific network or general eliteness or county? Uh, and the exam is helpful because uh, it, they have different timing, right? We can assume this uh, scholar, this general passed the exam in a different uh, year uh, or in the next year, we construct placebo networks to show you that this is really driven by the specific network we observe rather than a general uh, eliteness. Oh, so we measure the uh, war mobilization uh, by the soldier deaths, and this records you now. This is the records at individual level, and this is exists because I mentioned to you that their families received the compensations. So we know who died in which battle uh, and you know, where, which county they came from. So we digitalized over thirty thousand uh, soldier deaths, and we we know we can construct a county year panel based on this individual records. And then we check a, a measurement error about them using different ways I won't tell you for now. And then we measure the, uh, you know, we are particularly interested in the, how this war make this regional, it is local ones to move to the national political stage. So to measure that, we construct a database for the national level offices for close to a century. So this is a really a long panel, which we could see all this, you know, what happens brief before the war, uh, during the war and after the war. Uh, and uh, so let me be uh, uh, about it. The first part is a fairly standard. We just look at a, a county year uh, a level panel. We do a standard dif difference in difference analysis. We are interested in uh, how these elite connections in a county uh, correlate with soldier deaths before and after he then took power. So we have typical you know, county year uh, fixed effect controls over time. And sometimes you also include this prefecture by year fixed effect. So the, the comparison is really relatively a small region. Uh, so even just to show you the raw data, which is already suggestive, so this is just divided the counties in Hunan into two groups. The solid line are those with some connections, some people in that network. The dashed line are those not without uh, any connections. And you would say there seems to be a, something happened after he took power for the connected counties. So if you do this more systematically, uh, you know, if I um, look at the coefficient, you see this seems fairly clear whether you use, whether we use the weighted measure or unweighted measure. You know, there's no pre-trends, and after he took power, seems to be a stable effect over time. The magnitude is about 23% higher uh, in terms of soldier deaths. Uh, so. I, I want to show you a lot of other stuff we can discuss later, but I want to move to the second part uh, because there's another, the second question we are interested, after is interested in is how this connection driven soldier deaths affect elite power. So we want to know how war mobilization uh, affect elite power 
but we don't want to know random deaths. We are particularly interested in the deaths driven by our first part of analysis. So this naturally you know, raises an empirical issue, like, you know, it sounds like you want to use connection, predicted death to look at how that affect power, right? But if we only, uh, you know, do that within Hunan province, it's not, uh, there's a problem because our connection itself would also have a direct effect on power. To address this challenge, uh, we are bring all the other counties where those, you know, they also have different degree of connections, but they didn't have experienced soldier deaths. So that groups gives us a comparison to know, to be able to separate the connections effect from connection predicted soldier deaths. So empirically, this will be implemented basically by using the Hunan dummy interacted with the, the, uh, the connections at the county level to predict soldier deaths and then look at how that affect uh, uh, elite power over time. Uh, another appealing setting, <laughs> appealing feature of this setting is we have multiple sources of connection, right? So we basically have over identification uh, issue. Like then, if we you know we can have a direct look at the uh, effect of one component or one source of connection using the other component as the instrument. If there's still a concern that oh that component itself has direct effect, that would be show, would show up in that type of identification analysis. Uh, so which we find not to be the case. I just show you to show you some pictures. This is just a raw data where we divide the counties into four groups. Those are you know with connected counties in Hunan, connected counties in other provinces, unconnected in both groups. And there are two patterns, I think. The first is just, you, know, you can see clearly, the first group is those connected counties in Hunan experience a rise of national level offices in the later stage of the war and after the war. Uh, whereas the other is, you know, can the other connected counties, you know, always have some advantages, but the effect seems to be stable over time, right? So this is, you can think this is roughly like our reduced form uh, comparison. So we, we, we still need to make sure that, oh, this is driven, this rise is really driven by war mobilization rather than, you know, connected in Hunan suddenly has some advantage in later stage of the war, for example. Uh, so this can, uh, can be done uh, step by step. So uh, I'll show you the, the highway prediction where we use the connection in Hunan, or Hunan interacting with the county level connection to predict soldier deaths, right? Where we can directly check the impact of Hunan and the connections, uh, how they look like over time. And we'll compare uh, our IV with our OS if, uh, result. So uh, let me just show you the main result. So the first two columns, uh, it's like you confirm the motivation pan, uh, motivation figure, just to say, oh, it, it looks like the connected connection in Hunan uh, become more important in terms of having more national level offices after the war. And whereas in other, con other provinces, connection effect is relatively stable. So it didn't change much over time. So the difference between these two gives us the reduced form. We, we, will be know, we will be able to know how this uh, connection and Hunan over time increase the, how many uh, reduced, for, how many national level offices get increased. And this is pretty high because we are talking about uh, uh, 200 offices uh, held by 1,600 uh, counties in a year. So the mean is fairly low. Uh, so this is a, a more than half uh, the mean. And then we have the first stage is like, we look at how the connections and the Hunan predict the soldier deaths. So this is a, just a different specification from the first part, but it's the same messages. And this, this tool gives us the IV estimate. So you can interpret, so how to interpret this result, this would say, oh, one direct link in a county increased 256, more soldier deaths in the decade after the general took power, because the unit is a thousand here. 
And this 256 uh, more deaths is associated with uh, you know, this 52 higher uh, like national level offices held by a county year. And this two would give us together, would give us an IV estimate of the column five, which it's a, the interpretation would say a per thousand uh, soldier deaths associated with this number or more national level offices, which is very high because it doubles the mean. Uh, and if you do this in a simple ORS, you'll find the estimate is slightly higher than the IV, but the two are not dramatically different. Uh, as a suggestive evidence in the ORS, we can run a horse race between the soldier death measure and our instrument measure. If you compare uh, the result in column three, and the seven, I think it's a suggestive. It just shows you that, you know, the connections rule disappears once we control for soldier deaths. All this together just indicated that, you know, this war mobilization creates opportunity for these connected counties in Hunan, which consequently elevated their power measured by the national level offices. Uh, and if you are still, you know, we are still worried about, you know, this connection has specific effect, especially those in Hunan and after the war, etc. So we do do some uh, over identification just by separating different sources of a connection, and you can use one source to predict soldier deaths, and the other source doesn't matter. It's a you know, it's kind of reassuring that it's not the direct effect of connections. Uh, so. Uh, then finally, I want to ask, uh, you know, we showed that countries with more- Precious, Sorry, uh, we are running out a bit of, out of time. Uh, would it be possible just to take a, you know, a minute or two to conclude and- um... Yeah, sure. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the final message I want to say is that if you have a look at the people and in a county, which type of people uh, benefited? Uh, is that only one group or is it those in the network? or there also are the uh, group benefited. What we find is actually is that those in the network certainly benefited, but the benefits also apply to other groups uh, in that county. So which led to the long run patterns, I won't have time to show you, uh, but the main message is to say war well, mainly elites in two senses. The first is certainly benefited those in the network but it's also created some new ideas from the home county of the old one. Uh, so I think I, I can stop here. I don't need to uh, repeat to summarize things. I can, you know, in the Q&A, if there's questions, I can uh, refer to these materials, yeah. Oh, great, thank you so much, Rushi. It's been very interesting. Um, now, if you have a question, can you please use your raise your hand button? And uh, we're gonna call and unmute you. Yeah, I saw you. you can speak. Uh, yes. Uh, just, I mean, I guess this is what you were saying at the end, and maybe I just kind of, I'd like to understand a bit more. So, you you were saying that so you have those kind of connected elites that raised those this army and kind of led to more people dying, and then from those areas you have more people who kind of go and end up in in national office. Can you try to kind of distinguish between, and I think this you were saying that like, it's not just those people that were connected before that end up in national office. There's yeah. even some new elites, and but are those new elites kind of being driven by their connected, can you can you place them in the in the overall network? They might not have been connected to Zhang directly, but they were connected to the person who were connected to Zhang, kind of like looking at them all. Oh, I, kind of not just doing the, whether or not they're connected, but kind of the, taking into account the, the distance between the two, uh, yeah, the kind of the new elites and the and the old elites in a sense, yeah. or maybe I don't know if you can do I'm it. Not, uh, but let me first t tell you how, how, how this look like, and I don't think we are able to do that. So one piece of so why do we care about this first? 
is that the, they have different long run implications. The first is if we only if it's only those in the network benefit, uh, it's useful. It's, in, you know, it's not surprising, but this also maybe uh, imply that uh, if they exited, right, they are gradually getting old and <laughs> exited, then their yeah. influence would die out. Whereas if not only in those, uh, and then this means that there could be possible long run consequences. So we did two things. One is uh, we just look at the dynamic patterns in the long run. And what's nice here is we really have a like a long panel for a century. Uh, mm -hmm. The second is we directly examine, uh, we will do some decomposition, look at those in the network and those outside the network. So the first pattern, just to show you that if you look at this year by year, you see some, you know, so some persistent until the end of the, the uh, dynasty, but you also see some fluctuation, right? Uh, and if we look at the fluctuation by look at it, is this driven by the same individuals that gets, you know, say promoted and demoted and promoted and demoted, it's not driven by that group. It's driven by one group of people get power and exited and a new group of people get power and exited. Uh, but we don't really, uh, we don't have data to really know their, it's possible, you know, their relationship, it could be part of the story, could be typical patronage, right? Mm -hmm. And these are people from the same counties, still of the old elites. Another way is we just uh, do a composition, decomposition, we look at those in the network and those uh, not in the network, you would find the relative, you know, that's true, those in the network benefit hugely but those not in our network data also benefited. So these two together is what we mean by, you know, war created elites in two senses. But I didn't have a direct answer to your question, like what's the relationship of this cohort with the, that uh, previous cohort? I, I doubt we could be able to see the direct relationship, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's just the, you know, suggesting that, you know, there could be patronage going on, so that's how the power persist over time. Yeah. Could you could you look at whether or not they are, and may, again, this is me not knowing the, the context very well, but especially the second wave, could they be like people who are kind of basically given an opportunity to fight and given an opportunity to show their kind of strength? And basically what the what the fighting did is kind of yeah open up opportunities for people to show that they were valuable and then they kind of ended up rising through the ranks of the national office or is it may, i don't know if you have any direct information like whether those people were actually fighting or not but it would be interesting to understand the i see the, That's the, back, interesting. Yeah, the background I, of those non-elites who end up joining the yeah i, I want to say the national uh, offices data uh, you see it, it's, it's like, <laughs> on the one hand, it's amazing. It's kind of century. Yeah. We know which yeah. office by held by whom. But what we know by these people is relatively limited. We even yeah. don't know their age. So we only yeah. know their names, ethnicity, mm -hmm. and the limited information, maybe previous position. But but I, I think it's interesting. I don't know for sure. We can check. Mm -hmm. And I'm not confident we can see more. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have a time for one quick question. Is there any? Mattia, please. Mattia. Yeah, Mattia. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. Yeah, thank you for the paper. It's super interesting. Um, sorry if I missed this, but um, so basically one question I had while you were presenting is that the um, sort of main variable you use, which is soldier deaths. Oh, yeah. Um, it's only basically telling part of the story about mobilization, right? So I was wondering if you actually have information about how many people got mobilized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sort so, of tease out the effect of mobilization versus deaths. Because I mean, the two things might be correlated, but it might also be the case that the powerful elite might be able to Keep yeah, their so, away from battle and so on and so forth. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we use soldier deaths first is because it's such a costly measure. Uh, and of course, soldier deaths uh, reflect recruitment and a death rate. 
I think that really depends on your interpretation. You know, if you interpret this as people are more willing to die, that's also mobilization. But if you think this is like a strategic uh, deployment, then it's a, a you know less clear it's mobilization. So we don't know like how many people are recruited, but we do we could do a bit of heterogeneity to speak to these issues. So what we look at is we measure alternative opportunity uh, by the quota to the entry level exam. So that is a measure with the existing like mobility chance, where we find that when the mobility chances, the conventional mobility chance is better, this effect is smaller, you know, suggesting that the recruitment interpretation is reasonable. Then to look at deployment, we look at the different battles. So we know the battle information. We measure up the importance of battle by like whether the battle is around the major cities, for example. Uh, that, that the first three is what I told you, look at the alternative you know, opportunity to speak to uh, recruitment. And then we'll look at the battle and whether like a more important battle has a more higher death or larger effect for the elite network. So what do we find is there are two messages. First is this is the effect holding, hold, the death, more deaths is hold even within a battle, right? This is the column of four. So what means that that's, that's more consistent with recruitment is re regardless of deployment uh, that, uh, you know, each battle, there are more deaths from more connected countries. But we do find some suggestive evidence for deployment that more important battles tended to have this effect tended to be larger. Uh, but it's difficult to know, you know, that it's, it's, it could be, you know, they trust their, this type of soldiers more. So they ask them to, to fight more important battle or these soldiers are you know, more lawyer. We, we don't know the exact channel. I think, but at least the, the two pieces of evidence are suggesting that you know, recruitment interpretation is a part of you know, a larger part of the story. Is that clear? So yeah. Thank yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rishi. Uh, it's been really great to hear you speak. So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, I just want to mention that we're going to have the webinar next uh, Wednesday at slightly different time. It's going to be at 1.30 to 2.30 UK time. Uh, Fang Wen Lu from Renmin University of China is going to be presenting SMS interventions for, uh, for reducing uh, medicine overuse, a field experiment in China. And we really hope to see many of you there. Um, thank you everyone for attending and thank you so much, um, Rushi, for uh, your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and feel free to email me and I apologize for being so fast in some session. It's a long paper and a bit complicated, but hopefully now you all become expert of Chinese history. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rishi. If you, uh, you would like to stay on and talk to the panel, feel free. Um, attendees, thank you for joining us. Yeah, feel free to leave, but if there are any questions.